Houston Astrodome, the eighth wonder of the world. It opened in 1965, the first dome stadium in the world. Today, perhaps, it will see its final game. Game four of the league division series, it's the Astros and the Atlanta Braves. The Braves with one win, and then they move on. Hello, everyone. I'm John Miller with Rick Sutcliffe. Welcome to our telecast. We had an amazing day here yesterday, and it went the way of the Braves. Uh, today, Atlanta tries to close it out for that big game pitcher, John Smoltz. Right now, though, probably a six or seven inning pitcher because of elbow problems that he's had. And that bullpen yesterday, he used everybody, did Bobby Cox, including starters Kevin Millwood and Greg Maddox. So it's anybody's guess who will be in there today. Yeah, there's no telling with Bobby Cox. Yesterday's ball game with Mike Hampton dealing and the Atlanta Braves down two to nothing. Bobby Cox said we hadn't hit two balls hard all day. He just kind of sat back and watched. But when Brian Jordan hit that three run homer, he knew they had a chance to win it. He went for it. He brought Greg Maddox in out of the bullpen. Kevin Millwood for the save. John Rocker with the win. That's how important that game was to Bobby Cox. All right. It was uh, an amazing day. And now we'll see what he's got left for today. Now for the Houston Astros, the situation is dire. Not only do they need the win to stay alive, but Shane Reynolds is going on short rest, their starter. He's a six or seven inning pitcher at this stage. Jose Cabrera went two tough innings yesterday. Doug Henry went two innings. And their great closer, Billy Wagner, is most likely not available. Well, the story today is Shane Reynolds. He has got to step up. He's done it in the past. He's pitched on three days rest. That's not been a problem. But yesterday, the story was Billy Wagner. Where was he? Jeff Bagg well, wondering that himself, looking down to the bullpen. He was not available. He's not available today. That's why Shane Reynolds becomes so important. All right. So the Astros have come all this way. A strong season, one in which they had to overcome adversity many times. And now one final time. John Smoltz with the elbow problems up against Shane Reynolds, who has been struggling down the stretch as well. The Astrodome, one final time. We'll see. ESPN's coverage of the divisional playoffs is brought to you by AT&T. It's all within your reach. And by Quaker State for protection beyond 3,000 miles under any driving conditions. The 35th year of baseball at the Astrodome and in all that time, and in fact, in all the time of their history, dating back to 1962, the Astros have never won a postseason series. The man trying to break their hearts this year, Brian Jordan. And yesterday, he drove in all of the runs for the Atlanta Braves. A postseason record for the most RBIs in a game while driving in all of his team's runs. It's never happened in October before. Walt Weiss, of course, made it all possible with his near miraculous stab of the would-be game-winning base hit by Tony Eusebio in the 10th inning. Just an astounding play. There, there were plaudits to go around for the Atlanta Braves yesterday. You know, you would have thought they'd been talking about Maddox, Millwood coming out of the bullpen, John Rocker with bases loaded, nobody out. But both teams before the game could not believe the play that Walt Weiss made. What a momentum swing that created. The Astros take the field. And is this the last time that they'll take the field at the Astrodome? Here's the Pepsi Atlanta Braves batting order. Gerald Williams leads off in left field. Brett Boone at second base. Chipper Jones, third base. Brian Jordan, suddenly he's the man that you might be well advised to pitch around. Six for 12, seven RBIs in the three games. Brian Plesko back in there at first base. Andrew Jones, center field. Eduardo Perez, the catcher. Jose Hernandez, the shortstop hitting eighth. And John Smoltz, the pitcher. That's ninth. And on the mound for the Houston Astros, just arriving out there, the tall right-hander, a 16-game winner this year. That is Shane Reynolds. He finished the year in a slump, but on three days of rest last Tuesday, the first game of this series, he came back big time and pitched a real strong game. And he's done that seven times in his career. His record's only one and two, but a very respectable 3.30 ERA. Talking with Brian Jordan, John, before the ball game, he said it was something that he heard on ESPN that really motivated him for this series. He said he heard all of the Houston Astros pitchers talking about how they're not going to let Chipper beat him. They were going to make Brian Jordan do the damage. And you know what? He's been glad to do it.
defensively behind Shane Reynolds. A little change at shortstop, Tim Bogart. Greg Vigio says defensively he's probably the best shortstop that I played with. They're also going with the defense in the outfield. Javier inspires. You might wonder why not Daryl Ward. You would think they might want to hit one out of the ballpark. Somebody turn this momentum thing around. the time Ward with not a lot of experience out there Larry Durker going with the experience this afternoon Ward, of course had always been a first baseman they plan for him to go to winter ball this year and work on his outfielding because there's probably not going to be much call for him to play first base for this ball club for a while yet with Jeff Bagwell over there here is Gerald Williams to lead it off for Atlanta Brett Boone and Chipper Jones will follow a quick turnaround for these ball clubs. Yesterday's ball game, a four-hour, 19-minute classic that ended at 7.30 Houston time. And here we are just a bit after noon the next day playing again. That one is cracked hard to left field. Spires can't get it. we will have to go chase it. Williams has great speed. He's on his way to second. Spires up with the ball, and Williams will turn and hold at second base. And the first pitch of the game, a double and perhaps an ominous beginning for the Astros. The one thing you look for when a pitcher comes back on three days rest is the velocity on his fastball. Does he have that little extra pop that normally he has with the full rest? That fastball right there on the outer half of the plate, yet Gerald Williams able to pull that ball. Really Spires doing everything he possibly can. Not able to come up with it. Thus far, the velocity of Shane Reynolds doesn't look to be there. You don't normally pull a fastball in that location off of him. Now, Brett Boone, and he's had a fine series, six for 14. Gerald Williams is now six for 15. And they're going for that first run right away. That bunt is foul. And it is one strike to Brett Boone. Boone got a big hit in the 12th inning yesterday. Otis Nixon got it started. Down with. A one ball two strike count he got a, a hanging breaking ball or whatever it was from Jay Powell and poked it into left field to get them started and then Brett Boone also got a base hit and uh, that was the beginning of the winning rally later in the inning a two run double by Brian Jordan also with two strikes on the count. Bagwell very shallow at first. No bun here. He fouls it. Came up, hit him on the, the body, and the count is 0 2. Also, one of the problems for the Braves, it, it seemed to be a, a vulnerability of the Braves, their top two hitters in the order had the lowest on base average of any top two slots in the National League. Not getting on all that often for the likes of Chipper Jones and Brian Jordan. But in this series, that has not been the case. Gerald Williams is hitting 400, and as you saw, Brett Boone is hitting for 29. So they've been on base all the time. Well, he got jammed with that one and hooked it foul down the left field line. Oh, and to the count. Of course, he, in a perfect world, like to get the ball to the right side to get Williams over. But with two strikes, Rick, uh, you can't be so choosy. You know one thing about Bobby Cox too they talk about how much confidence he gives his players in that situation right there after the sacrifice bunt it looked like he put Boone on his own he said forget about it Vanson. go ahead and drive him in yourself Ball two there's a splitter did he swing no first base umpire Randy Marsh ruling in favor of Brett Boone 
And we were hearing talk before the game that Shane Reynolds was saying that he really didn't have a splitter right now that it was a pitch that had been his out pitch for a long time but he just didn't seem to have the feel for it the last several starts of the regular year. But I know you kind of raised your eyebrow on that one because yeah. he threw a couple of good ones to Klesko in the big sixth inning in game one on Tuesday. He might not be as consistent with it as he has been in the past but I thought that was just a decoy to try to get the Atlanta Braves to think he's not going to use that pitch. They're not going to fall for that. Chipper Jones on deck. Nobody out. Runner at second. One and two the count to Boone. Fastball. Tagging at second. Williams. The catch by Javier. And Williams will easily make it into third base. So Boone gets the job done. He moves him over to third base for Chipper Jones with one out. That's what Brett Boone was brought over here for his experience in big ball games. He's confident defensively out there. He can do some things offensively. And he's proven that thus far in this postseason. They don't care about what his numbers were coming into this in the regular season. They just wanted his glove behind their tremendous pitching. Now they want him to hit a little bit, and he's doing that. Chipper Jones, the infield stays back, except for the third baseman, Tamanetti. Right center. In a hurry, Everett got it. Here comes Williams. Here comes the throw. He's in there. And Atlanta has gone ahead one to nothing. Well, he needed all of that speed there. Pretty strong throw from Everett. One to nothing, Atlanta. Everett doing everything he can to get to this ball, but once he caught it, he's a little bit off stride. It took him one more step than what he would have liked to have taken to get that throw to Eusebio at home plate, and it was just a step that Gerald Williams beat it by. Chipper Jones, the Braves' big slugger from the regular season, getting his first RBI of this series. Of course, Brian Jordan has had seven RBIs. A hard sinker down and in. Jordan, who's got that bad right hand, checked his swing a little bit, then took his right hand off the bat and kind of shook it a little bit. Jordan, seven RBIs in three games. The all-time record for RBIs in a postseason series of four games or less in the National League is eight and done twice as he hits a foul one ball one strike Dusty Baker in the four game NLCS while he was with the Dodgers in 1977 had eight RBIs and Gary Matthews in 1983 with the Phillies in a four game league championship series had eight RBIs of course Nomar Garcia Parra had 11 RBIs in last year's four game division series against Cleveland that's the all time record in a four game series one ball and two strikes. There's a splitter right there. If you would have thought the Atlanta Braves went for Shane Reynolds saying he didn't have that pitch anymore, he probably wouldn't used it. Well, he's going to use it today, and it looks like he's got the feel for it back. Two down, nobody on. Fastball, base hit. So. Another hit for Brian Jordan, his seventh of the series in 13 at bats. You know, I was talking with the Atlanta Braves coaching staff before the ball game, and they said, you know, they think Chipper Jones is the MVP of the National League, particularly because of what he did the last couple of weeks. But he may not be the MVP on their ball club. They said Brian Jordan carried that club the first three months of the season. And when you look at his numbers, 100 runs scored, he drove in more runs than Chipper did this year. 115 RBIs, he's running. Clasco takes it off. You save your strong throw. He got him. Bogart with the tag, and uh, the inning is over. But Atlanta is leading. John Smoltz takes the hill. For three years now, he has struggled in these division series games. Carl Everett in center field. Ken Caminetti, third base. Billy Spires, left field. Tony Eusebio, the catcher. Tim Bogar is short in place of Gutierrez. And Shane Reynolds is the pitcher, batting ninth. And on the mound for Atlanta, a guy who's been here so many times before, John Smoltz. He has never lost a division series game, winning each of his starts in the last three years. And he's won 11 games in postseason play when you add up 
all the playoff series and World Series efforts. Well, you wonder why this guy only won 11 games during the course of the year. He's had a lot of arm trouble, particularly in that elbow. He had to alter his delivery, and he did that back on July 30th. At that time, left-handers hitting 253 with just two home runs off of him. From that point on, 276 with five homers. Called a strike to Biggio. Nice pitch on the outside. He did something that seems almost impossible. In mid-year, he changed the way he throws pitches. A top line, shallow right. This is Boone. And there is one away. So Biggio is again kept off the base bags. Defensively, Andrew Jones back out there again in center field. I thought it was Brett Boone also yesterday catching several line drives off the bat of the Houston Astros being positioned perfectly. Defense always the priority with Bobby Cox when he goes about assembling a lineup because he knows his pitching is his strength and he needs somebody to catch the ball. Walt Weiss, of course, was in there and made that game saving play in the 10th inning. There's a strike to Stan Javier. Javier yesterday hit a line shot that was caught by Boone, one of those plays you're talking about. One of the hardest hit balls of the day. And that was against Kevin Millwood, who got the save yesterday. And of course, in Millwood's one hitter on Wednesday, Javier made the final out, crushing a line shot at Brett Boone. So in his last two up to at bats against Millwood, he has crushed the ball about as hard as Stan can hit the ball and made it out each time. You know, it was interesting. Millwood had that one hitter on Wednesday. The last time a complete game one hitter was pitched in postseason play was by Jim Lomborg in the 67 World Series against the St. Louis Cardinals. His no hitter was broken up by Stan Javier's dad, Julian Javier, but the only hit of that game. He says his dad, Julian Javier, used to be a, an outstanding second baseman on some great Cardinals clubs back in the 60s. He is uh, retired down in the Dominican Republic, plays a lot of golf, and he's enjoying life. And he may be looking in today. One and two to Stan Javier, and time is taken. Smoltz stopped in mid motion. Now, Javier has hit 300 against him over the years with nine hits in 30 career at bats. And against Smoltz, that goes as, a, as an excellent record. That's down the left field line, a base hit. Gerald Williams was pushed over to the line to begin with, and he will hold Javier to a single. So again, Chalk went up to positioning for the Atlanta Braves. Well, it's basically the same pitch right here that he popped Vigio up on. The difference with a left-handed hitter, it runs away from you towards the big part of your bat. It doesn't run in on you like it did the right-handed Vigio. This is why Smoltz struggles with left-handed pitchers. I'm excuse me, left-handed hitter. He comes out in that three-quarter delivery angle, and they get a much longer, better look at the rotation on the baseball. They look for that fastball up. When they get it, they can do things like that with it. Now Bagwell sinker just a little bit low for ball one. It's really amazing what Smoltz has been able to do. This guy was a pitcher for 20 years coming over the top and a dominant pitcher at that. He basically had to learn to throw all over again with that new angle. Fastball for a strike. He did it one day in the bullpen just fooling around and he dropped down a little bit. And uh, as you see the the numbers Rick and there they are lefties have hit a lot better against him with this new delivery. But he said he realized he had no pain throwing from the three quarter angle. Is that what David Cohn would call the Laredo slider and that's what Barry Larkin said astounded him the first time he faced Smoltz with this new delivery he said wow. I was not prepared for him to be throwing from three quarters and throwing over 90 miles an hour with great movement and then throwing a Laredo slider a la David Cohn. There it is again missing and it is three and one to Jeff Bagwell and the Astros waiting for Bagwell's slumbering bat to begin speaking again. In the three games the Astros have scored only 10 runs. There goes Javier but Bagwell walks. And the Astros have their own early threat, trailing one to nothing with Carl Everett coming up and then Ken Cavanetti behind him. What Bobby Cox does not need today 
is to have John Smoltz knocked out early in this game. Although he's got a guy out there who could go a good long while if if need be. That's one thing about the pride of the starters on the Atlanta Braves though they know for the most part they're going to be there six seven innings. Strike one on the inside to Everett. Everett gets right on top of that plate. It's hard to get the ball too far in without hitting it. Terry Mulholland was saying that that was a big difference coming over to Atlanta. He said the confidence and the pride the starters take in being out there, keeping that bullpen fresh by doing their job. Jammed in, broken back. Press go to second. And Hernandez will hold it. Over to third, Javier. Bagwell forced it second. Everett taking first, and now Caminetti with two on and two out. There's another ball game being played right now on ESPN2. The New York Mets and Arizona Diamondbacks. No score after one inning at Shea Stadium. The Diamondbacks in the same predicament as the Astros. They must win to keep that series alive. Ken Caminetti. Well, he's the man in this series for the Astros. Seven for 13. Two home runs, although he had three hits yesterday. They did strike him out with the bases loaded in the seventh inning in a big at bat. It was Mike Lemlinger who got him in one of the pivotal at bats of, of the game. They've only scored 10 the whole series. They've only had 23 hits this series. So he's had nearly a third of their hits and a half of their RBIs. Well, that batting average for the rest of the team in this series looks a lot like the career batting average of Ken Kemenini against John Smoltz, just 213. But this is a different John Smoltz. It's a different angle. Kemenini should have some better bats. A slap that sinker foul off to the third base side into the crowd. One ball, one strike. The biggest difference in Smoltz is on his breaking ball. When he was up top in that overhead position, he had a lot more tilt to it. That's what makes it difficult on a left hander. You see the breaking ball, you can think you can get to it, but it just keeps going down. Now that he's out there in that three-quarter angle, it stays flatter, and you're able to get part of the bat on the baseball. Javier, who singled, is at third base. Everett, who forced Bagwell at first. It goes to two and one. Caminetti, remember, finished the regular season in a hot streak. And including these three games played in this series so far, he has had 39 RBIs in his last 35 games. One to nothing Atlanta. Back out of play. Man, he's... He can still find that little extra on that fastball when he needs to. 96 miles per hour on the radar gun with that one. Well, he's not really in any danger of hurting anything. That being Schmoltz, there's no ligament damage, no tendon damage. He's just got an arthritic elbow that when he puts it in certain spots, he has pain there. He's found a spot where it doesn't hurt, and he's trying to learn to pitch all over again. There goes Everett from first. The ball too far into Cabinetti, and Everett steals second uncontested. So now a base hit could mean two runs. Billy Spires, another left-handed hitter, is on deck. Spires awaiting his turn, hoping to bat here in the first inning. Look how deep Brett Boone is playing right there. You wonder why he's able to get to so many balls that are hit hard. He's in shallow right field. Just missing with a sinker on the inside. Smoltz wanted that one. That was close. Ball four. The bases are loaded. There's about a 10 inch difference in the release point with John Smoltz. And because of that, his location will suffer from time to time. Perez trying to get that call on the inside corner. Not able to do that. Now the bases are loaded. And one of the guys on the Houston Astro team who's come up with a lot of clutch hits in his career is at home plate and Billy Spires. Eight hits in 21 career at bats against John Smoltz. A 381 lifetime average against Smoltz, the best in the club. Three men on Javier, Everett, Caminetti. Ball one with a fastball. Too long. And this is where you. count he's swinging a ball that was going to bounce before it got to home plate when he hit into the fielder's choice get a good pitch to hit he took it it's a little bit high two and oh and Paris thought it was in there and John Smoltz and Bobby Cox 
They both thought it was in there, and Smoltz feels like he's getting squeezed right now. Well, there's a little bit of a carryover effect from yesterday. Dana DeMuth, yesterday's game was down at first base. Greg Maddox thought he had Craig Biggio struck out. On the replay, we saw Biggio did take a swing. He should have been called out, but Dana DeMuth said no swing, and the inning continued. That could have broke the ball game over. It didn't. Atlanta was able to hold on and eventually win it, but Bobby Cox has never been afraid to tell an umpire just how he feels. He was ejected, I think, for more games than any other manager this year. Big, big pitch right now. Two balls, no strikes to Billy Spires. Three men on, two men down. Smoltz has thrown 22 pitches in this first inning. He's walked two. Spires is sixth batter of the inning. That is in there for a strike. Two and one. I think that's a good move on Spires' part right there. Go ahead and take a pitch. Smoltz may walk you. You may not have to put the ball in play. But the one thing they have done this inning, they've run the pitch count deep on John Smoltz. And we know the bullpen for both of these clubs is awful thin. Javier Everett and Caminetti ready to run. And a foul popped off to the left. And he is uh, he's staying with the hard stuff here on Bill Spires. Shane Reynolds down one to nothing. Hoping to see the Astros put him ahead right now. They've got the chance, but they need the clutch two out hit. Javier Everett. Caminetti and the off and running of the crack of the bat with two down. Jammed him right to Boone. And the inning is over. They cannot find that big hit. Another bases loaded. No run inning. John Smoltz and the Braves with a one nothing lead. Smoltz getting through that first inning despite some uh, bad feeling between himself. Happens the next time out. Smoltz and uh, Walt Weiss talking it over. Walt Weiss, who made that great play yesterday, you know, who was one of the first guys to call him in his clubhouse after the game to congratulate him on the, the game saving play, Ken Caminetti. Caminetti has become friends over the years with Weiss simply because he admired the way he played, and uh, the more he got to know him, the more he liked him. And how about Bobby Cox having the infield in in that situation probably the slowest guy in the game Tony you save at home plate you get a ground ball it's at somebody it's a double play well if Cox would have had him back and they would not have been shading up the middle so far that game's over with everything Bobby Cox did yesterday worked out that's the only reason they were able to win that game all of the pitching changes Brian Tesco and that's a ball outside and of course Larry Durker walked up for want of the big hit, but also and he left himself open for the second guess by not walking Brian Jordan there in the 12th inning. On the one hand, that is Ryan Tesco at the count of two balls and no strikes facing Shane Reynolds here in the second. Larry Durker has never been one to issue many intentional walks. He had 17 all year. And just by comparison, Bobby Cox ordered 55. Intentional walk. So that's uh, quite a difference. And Bobby Cox, I think, was more toward the league average, and Larry Durker nowhere close. So that's the way he does it. But there was some second guessing, I think, even in his own clubhouse about that. Two and one the count. And that's a ball too low. Three and one. Andrew Jones on deck. The Braves getting a run of the first inning, they really kind of uh, manufactured it. A double. Brett Boone got Gerald Williams to third with a fly ball to right. Trevor Jones got him home with a fly ball to center. So they were able to, uh, with some sound fundamental baseball, get the first run of this game. Ryan Tresco, who's got a real quick bat, as we saw there from backtrack, a 94 mile an hour reading on that last swing. <coughs> it's the Shane Reynolds fastball. Drawn a leadoff walk. 
Wednesday night on ESPN. It's National Hockey Night from Joe Louis Arena in Detroit. Western Conference Central Division clash. St. Louis Blues and the Detroit Red Wings. The Blues led by Captain Pierre Turgeon. The Red Wings winners of the Stanley Cup in consecutive years, 97 and 98, led by Captain Steve Eiserman. It's hockey on ESPN. Old time hockey. Eddie Shore, Toe Blake. Check it out. Kick, save, and a beauty. You ever play hockey? <laughs> oh, you're too tall for hockey. I'd like to see you on skates. How about Tom Glavin, huh? He's a pretty good hockey player. He was an outstanding hockey player growing up in the Boston area. <laughs> he was uh, good enough to have been drafted by the Los Angeles Kings of the NHL. He was, uh, when he played hockey as a kid, he said he was Wayne Gretzky. I said, you mean you were like, a good stick handler and you you fed your team he says no I was Wayne Gretzky who only shot and never passed. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't big on those assists huh. There's the splitter one ball two strikes to Andrew Jones. He said when he played baseball he was Fred Lynn. He wasn't a pitcher he was Fred Lynn driving in all the runs. And he's still a pretty good hitter today. I think he made a pretty good career decision as well. I don't know many hockey players that are making the kind of money they're paying baseball players nowadays. We still got a beautiful set of teeth. <laughs> One and two to count. Struck him out with a low fastball. So young Andrew Jones is dispatched by Shane Reynolds. One away. Klesko still at first. He really is struggling right now. He's one of the better fastball hitters in the game, but it's it's almost like he, he kept the donut on the bat right there. That's a fastball, outer half, not able to catch up with it. Maybe playing 162 games. He only missed six innings on the year, that being Andrew Jones starting to catch up with him a little bit. That's a tired swing he's got going right now. Eddie Perez. He got a hanging slider and he bloops it into left center. Breaking for third, Tresco. Everett overthrows, backed up by Reynolds, and he holds Perez over at first base. First and third, one out for Atlanta. I think one thing that goes unnoticed a little bit with Atlanta is well, they don't have a lot of great team speed, but they are all great base runners. They make very few mistakes on the base path. When you lose a Javi Lopez, you lose an Andres Galarraga, you can't afford to make some mistakes out there. Ned Yost, the third base coach, encouraging, encouraging Klesko to get down there. He knows how important that is with just one out. Reynolds over to back up the play, and that maybe saved a, an extra base being taken. Well, it was a bad throw on the part of Everett. He didn't get it down. You got the turf to help you on the bounce there. Any speed at all on the part of Perez, he would have been at second base. But of course, he's got the bad knees. And that's a cold strike to Jose Hernandez. The infield double play depth. Big moment here. The Braves who got one of the first with a great chance to get another one right here. Yeah, Everett's throw would have been a perfect throw had Klesko been sliding into the on-deck circle. I think he would have nailed it. Smoltz, the pitcher, on deck. Bagwell holding against Perez at first, although he is no threat to steal. And the splitter taken by Hernandez. Jose Hernandez, seven hits in 26 career at-bats against Shane Reynolds. He had 19 home runs during the regular season. One to nothing, Atlanta leading. Meanwhile, at Shea Stadium, the Diamondbacks and the Mets have played two full innings, no score there. That game being shown on ESPN2 right now. Mike Piazza is not in the lineup again today. Although it didn't seem like the Mets missed him a whole lot last night. They scored nine runs as they uh, clobbered the Diamondbacks to take command in that series, two games to one. The difference between the Mets situation and the Braves situation is that they both lead their respective series. The Mets, if they lose today, have to go back to Arizona for the final game. This could be two. Did you have a second one? Hold on the first. <laughs> a double play. One to nothing Atlanta. Heading to the last of the second. One to nothing. The Braves lead the Astros. Last of the second. 
The new John Schmoltz on the mound right now. He's created a lot of problems for the opposition as he has throughout his career, but he's doing it a little bit differently now. This is the old John Schmoltz. Watch the arm angle there he is there. Look at that. Now take a look at this one right here. This is where he's going to be. Look at him down in there in that angle right there. That's why it's so much tougher for a right-handed hitter. I mean, that ball's basically starting out at your back. It's going to have more sink to it. See his hand up top there, though, how he's able to keep on top of that fastball before. Now he's coming around it, underneath it. It's going to create more movement. And the great thing for Smoltz, the velocity's still there. Yeah. Off the fist by Eusebio and shallow right. Biggio throws him out, and there is one away. John Smoltz was talking recently about this new arm angle which takes the, the pain away from throwing for it. Compared to where I was before, I couldn't keep going. There's no way. Um, if you'd asked me three months ago, what do you think you can do to help this Braves team in the playoffs, I don't know if I could have answered it. Uh, it's been another amazing year. Even last year, to even think about what I went through last year, uh, Personally, I'm really the only person that's going to understand it. I really don't make any excuses or really try to tell too much of what goes on, but uh, this is another gratifying year. Uh, no matter how it turns out, for me personally, to be able to pitch in the postseason, couldn't ask for anything more. Just glad to be here. That's what his teammates love about him. They know that even though he's created that new arm angle, it's easier for him to pitch. This guy is still in a lot of pain to go out there every fifth day. Over the middle, base hit. That's where they wanted that ball to go in the tenth inning yesterday. Hit by Eusebio, but the base is loaded. Well, and the big difference between Jose Hernandez playing short and Walt Weiss is the fact Walt Weiss would probably have gotten to this ball. Hernandez is in the lineup because they expect him to hit. He did not hit in the top of the second. He hit into a double play, actually, which was worse than not putting the ball in play at all. Now Shane Reynolds. And back to the bag at first is Bogar. Tim Bogar getting his first start. Yesterday he got his first postseason at bat as a pinch hitter in the 11th and drew a walk. And today he's got his first postseason hit. The Buck, Smoltz, will go to first. Moon coming. So Reynolds. Gets it done. Bogar into scoring position for Biggio. John, a lot of people are surprised that John Smoltz was able to make this adjustment. Greg Maddox said he had no doubt in his mind that Smoltz could do it. He thinks Smoltz is the best athlete on the Atlanta Braves team. I said, Brian Jordan, Chipper. He said, you know what? There's nothing Smoltz can't do athletically. You could invent a sport, give him some time to prepare, and he'd be a master at it. Great golfer, great basketball player. Craig Biggio, he popped out the second his first time. 0 for 1. They're in the last of the second. 1 to nothing. Atlanta is leading. Oh, man, there's that slider. And it is 0 and 1. They played two and a half now at Shea Stadium over on ESPN 2. Diamondbacks nothing. Mets nothing. And I'm sure, Rick, that as if that score holds for another couple of innings, the the pressure will start to get unbearable for Arizona because it's all on them today. And they were the most prolific offensive ball club in the National League. There's that slider from the side by John Smoltz. All and two to Biggio. I guess if it's the quick Biggio or Jeff Bagwell or any of these hitters. All of the stuff that you've filed away in your memory about facing John Smoltz no longer applies. That sidearm slider outside. One and two. All of the videotape that you've looked at over the years, all of the thoughts that you, you've got, you know what he's going to do with two strikes. You know what he's done in the past when he's behind an account. You can forget about all of that now. Runner at second. Fastball. Straight foul right over toward the Astros dugout. One ball, two strikes. Now. Trying to paint that outside corner. Look at Perez reaching back there a little bit, but the velocity on that pitch was what kept Biggio from putting it in play. Eddie Perez likes to get way out there, and you saw his foot outside the catcher's box. Again, considerably out. And then just juggles it and does not get anybody. 
Bogart a third. Vigio safe at first. The Astros get a break. You're not going to get many breaks from the Atlanta Braves, and when you do, you've got to capitalize on that. What makes this a tough play for Hernandez is that he knows Greg Biggio is going to hustle down the line. He's done it throughout his career, and that's a great lesson for all young ball players. If you hustle like that and you get a reputation, that puts pressure on the infielder. They know they got to hurry. They got to come get the ball. They got to come up with it cleanly and make a good throw. Craig Biggio has always done that, and every now and then you get rewarded by getting on base. Javier now trying to deliver in the clutch. He did single his first time down the left field line. Owen won the count. Javier is hitting 375 in this division series. And he has a better than 300 average in his career against John Smoltz. Down and away. One ball and one strike. The Astros' top three hitters this year. Bagwell, Biggio, and Carl Everett, and a combined batting average of 306. In this series, they're hitting 139 against Atlanta. Those three, Bagwell, Everett, and Biggio. One and two to Javier. Javier walks away from the plate as if to think it over. Jeff Bagwell would be next. So Javier not only trying to deliver the run here in the clutch, but keep the inning going for the slugger to have a big RBI chance and a chance himself. One and two. Broken back. Chipper Jones. He got it. So the Astros, who four times have left the bases loaded in these last two games, have left five on base in two innings today. Atlanta won the Astros nothing we head to the third inning here in game four for this national John Smoltz leads off for Atlanta in the third Smoltz who had 274 this year one home run seven RBIs Gerald Williams will follow one to nothing Atlanta out in front the Smoltz is had to uh, sail through some troubled waters in the first two innings but the Astros have not scored. Driven to right field, and that is right over the head of Stan Javier. Smoltz will stop at second. There might be some fans here thinking that they're amazed. What are you doing letting the starting pitcher hit a double off of you? Well, if John Smoltz didn't have to pitch in a ball game, he wouldn't be a bad choice as a designated hitter. You watch this guy in BP. I mean, that's a great approach right there. He knows the ball is going to probably be away. He drives the ball to the opposite field. I've seen him in batting practice many, many times hit the ball out to right field, right center, and even dead center. Gerald Williams, who led off the game with a double, and then the Braves were able to move him around the bases without getting another hit. To go ahead in this game, and now Williams is trying to get Smoltz over the third base. Bagwell racing in right on top of the plate as he will. The pitch taken for ball one by Williams. He looks over at Ned Yost, the third base coach. I mean, Bagwell gets right in on top, right into the face of the hitter on that punt play. Caminetti shortened up at third as well. Nobody out. Here comes Bagwell. That's a foul. One ball, one strike. Well, the Braves have had their leadoff man reach base in each of the first three innings here. And they were able to get Williams home after his leadoff double in the first. Now Smoltz with a leadoff double here in the third. The Astros have had five men on base in two innings, but they have not been able to get the leadoff man out. So they've always gotten men on base after they had outs. There's the bunt. Uh-oh, nobody there. And he just does recover in time. Caminetti was right behind him there, but nobody covering third base, and that almost cost him his chance to get Williams at first base. Real good bunt there on the part of Gerald Williams. The ideal is to get the third baseman to field that ball. He got it going in that direction, and because of the turf, Eminetti realizes right there, I might have to come get that ball. He's got to get an out right there. He knows that. If he goes to the third base bag and the pitcher can't get to the ball, now you've got all kinds of problems. Eminetti knew that he might have to go get the ball. Reynolds able to get it. Unfortunately, able to set himself and record the out at first base. Biggio got the put out. Now Brett Boone. 
The Astros pull in at the corners. Caminetti at third, Bagwell at first. The middle infielders are back. And Boone chases that split finger pitch in the dirt. Strike one. And here's Atlanta with another chance to score a run without getting a hit. Chipper Jones drove in Williams from third with a fly ball in the first inning. Now Boone trying to do something similar here. Boone has hit 400 in this series. I'm surprised the infield is back right now. Well, that crossed them there. Although with the infield in, it might have gone through as well. But even had Bogar made a great play and thrown out Boone, that would have been a run. Well, I just don't think mentally you can afford to go down two to nothing to the Atlanta Braves. You take a look at this whole series. I mean, you know all about Atlanta starters. But they continue to come up with big performances in big games. Go back to game one. Even though Maddox gave up some hits, only two runs in seven innings. Millwood in game two, only one hit in nine innings. Glavin yesterday, two runs in six innings, but there was a box double play ball. They might not have scored in that game. They have not scored yet today. Chipper Jones. Back to the screen. It is on one. Chipper Jones getting his first. Division Series RBI with his fly ball in the first inning. Brent Boone just getting his first RBI of the series. So suddenly it's not just Brian Jordan having to drive in all the runs. And for the first time, the Astros bullpen will get to work. Holt, the right hander, up in the bullpen. Ordinarily a starting pitcher during the regular season, so he could give them a lot of innings today if they if they needed that. Two to nothing Atlanta. One out, one on. And the split finger pitch is swung out of miss. One and two to Chipper Jones. Holt kind of does the same thing for Houston that Terry Mulholland can do for the Atlanta Braves. That's why Bobby Cox was not concerned about his bullpen situation. He knows that Mulholland can not only pitch every day, but he'll pitch all day long if you need it. One and two. And a fly ball, shallow center. Out goes Bogon. Cooper Jones pops out to short. Out number two here in the third inning. And now Brian Jordan will come up. At New York, they're in the last of the fourth inning. Three and a half gone by. Nothing, nothing. Arizona and the Mets. Not supposed to have a very good splitter, huh? <laughs> He's had a real good one today. It's been his fastball that's created the problems for him. It was the first pitch he threw to Gerald Williams. He hit for a double. John Smoltz did the same thing on a fastball. Jordan singled his first time. A check swing and a fastball. Foul. And that is 0 1. Yeah. Reynolds got to the park this morning and was telling everybody that he well, really hadn't had a splitter to speak of the last several starts in the regular year. So it's, he's been having to make do even though he doesn't have his out pitch. Well, he knows that Brian Jordan listens to what we say. I mean, that was, that's what fueled Brian when he heard they were going to pitch around Chipper and get to him. That's a foul. Yeah. ESPN reporting that. The Astro pitchers were going to pitch around Chipper Jones. They'd rather face Brian Jordan. So Brian, so that that motivated him. It was an ESPN thing, an ESPN motivational technique, apparently. But he loves the postseason. He says, "This is what I play for. I thrive on the pressure." And it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to go out there and get seven RBIs in pressure games. Five all in one game. All under pressure. I mean, think of what he did yesterday as the count goes to 0 2 against Mike Hampton, maybe the best pitcher in the league this year, 22 and 4. He was cruising along. They hadn't really even hit a ball hard against him. Bobby Cox said he thought it maybe it had to be the only mistake Hampton made the whole day, and Jordan launched a three run homer, a stunning home run. And then in the 12th inning, the two run double. Those were the only runs they got, and it was just enough. They won it five to three. Two strikes to count. There goes the runner. Eusebio's throw. Pass Biggio into center field. So Eusebio skips another throw into center field as he did 
yesterday in the tenth inning on a steal by Otis Nixon. So Brent Boone steals the bag. Sabio threw out Brian Jordan back in the first inning with a pretty good throw. I think the reason Boone didn't get up to go to third right here, he couldn't believe he wasn't throwing out. Look at that. He's got plenty of time to get him right there. Instead, he just barely able to get the ball to the dirt. Biggio not able to come up with it. And another runner in scoring position for Brian Jordan. And he's not been leaving too many of them out there. The splitter for the strikeout. Yeah. The shame that Reynolds just doesn't have that pitch anymore. Two nothing. Bagwell coming up. Two to nothing. Atlanta. Last of the third inning. And the big sluggers coming up for the Astros here. From Rick Sutton. Jeff Bagwell. A slider for a strike. Bagwell walked his first time. Now, Bagwell's had one hit and nine at bats in the series, but he's also walked five times and been hit by a pitch one time. Ooh, where was that? Well, the, the, the Braves have actually walked Bagwell four out of his last five times. They just weren't going to let him beat him yesterday in the latter part of the ball game. Now with a two to nothing lead, though, you can challenge him. He can't tie the game up here. He went up after that high fastball, high foul down the right field line into foul ground. Jordan over the bullpen mound, and he makes the catch. Bagwell is gone. Now let's get an update from that Mets Arizona game. Lighter, who pitched a two hitter in that tiebreaker playoff game on Monday in Cincinnati. Now, four hitless innings tonight. He actually had a, a mediocre season for Al Lighter, but he has been their ace just as they had hoped in the biggest games of the year. What's ESPN going to do in the World Series? We're not going to have Al Lighter to help commentate that series if he keeps pitching like that. So, Nick Sutcliffe predicting the Mets will be in no, the big no, show. No, no. <laughs> Sorry, Atlanta. Sorry, Houston. One ball, two strikes. Well, if he keeps pitching the way he has, the Mets will get their best shot. Carl Everett down on strikes, a slider right in in the hand. So Everett is 0 for 2. Two down and nobody on. John Smokes. That fastball right there. He just straightens it out a little bit. Most of the time, that ball will run away from a left hander. Everett saw where it started. He thought the ball would come back to the heart of the plate where he could hit it. Uh -uh. Change up. Too low to Caminetti, who walked his first time. Well, Bagwell, Everett, Biggio in this series. Now five hits in 39 at bats. That's in the center and caught by Andrew Jones. So Smoltz facing Bagwell, Everett, and Cavanetti has his easiest inning so far. A nine pitch, three up, three down inning. Atlanta two, the Astros nothing. We head to the fourth inning from the Astrodome. Today on ESPN two at 8 East. Don't miss it. We're on the ESPN two. The Mets leading Arizona one to nothing into the top of the fifth inning at Shea Stadium. And as we mentioned, Al Leiter has not yet allowed a hit in that game. Shane Reynolds starts. Ryan Tresco with the split finger pitch. Tresco walked his first time. Reynolds has had particular trouble today with the leadoff man in an inning. Twice the Braves have led off innings with doubles, and each time they got that man home. They lead 2-0. One ball, one strike. Really surprising that he would walk a guy leading off an inning. Shane Reynolds. Among active pitchers, only Brett Saberhagen with better control than him, that being guys that have thrown over a thousand innings. Both of them less than two walks per nine innings. And that's going to help a guy trying to pitch on three days rest. That's what is in there for a strike. One ball, two strikes. Reynolds this year in 231 and two thirds innings walked 37. Versus 197 strikeouts. A ball and two strikes. Off the outside. Two and two. Andrew Jones and Eddie Perez will follow. Two runs, five hits, and one error for Atlanta. No runs, two hits, no errors for Houston. The splitter. Bring him out. Third strikeout for Shane Reynolds. He is throwing a lot more of those today than he did, I think, on Tuesday. 
pretty good ones too. You throw that fastball at the knees for a strike. They've got to protect against that again. That splitter looks like a fastball about halfway there. You start to take a swing at it, and next thing you know, it's down in the dirt, and you look kind of silly. Now Andrew Jones. By the way, at Shea Stadium, Greg Colbrun has just homered for the first hit against Al Leiter. In the first run, the Diamondbacks have tied the Mets at one in the fifth inning. That game is being shown right now on ESPN2. Here, 2 nothing Atlanta in the top of the fourth inning. One out, nobody on. Andrew Jones, the hitter. He's a strikeout victim in the second. Into the hole, it's short. Backhanded by Bogar. The one hop after to throw in time. Nice play. Two down. Let's go to Bill Pito for an update. All right, John, you'd mentioned it on ESPN2. Craig Colbrun, the batter, getting the start, not Yerbiel DeRaza because the lefty is going. Al Leiter had a no-hitter up until this point. Ricky Henderson goes back. He looked like he caught it, but no, he didn't. 1-1 one, one on the home run, top of the fifth. See, that's a problem right there with short outfielders. Huh? <laughs> you got Michael Jordan out there. He's still got the no-hitter. This is that AstroTurf Davy Concepcion kind of a throw from the hole at short by Tim Bogar. Nice play to get a very fast runner. Andrew Jones, Eddie Perez, who singled his first time, takes a called strike. Bogar ended up playing a lot of shortstop for the Astros last year after the All-Star break. And the year before, because of his glove. That's why I think defense is just so overrated. What's the difference if you get a base hit or you take a base hit away from the opposition? That's what Bogart did right there. It's a big part of, excuse me, underrated. That's a big part of the reason that Eddie Perez has been an everyday player this year. The splitters struck him out. But Shane Reynolds has his first. Three up, three down inning. Bill Spires coming up. Two to nothing. Atlanta. Which pitcher holds the record for the most strikeouts in a division series game? And everybody knows the answer to this one. It's too easy. I think it happened right here in the Astrodome, didn't it? Right here in the Astrodome. That, is that a hint? The, the question is incredibly easy. It happened here in the Astrodome in a game in which Randy Johnson was a starting pitcher. <laughs> Oh, and won the count to Bill Spires. He grounded a second with the bases loaded to end the first inning. Andrew Jones in left center for one away. Jose Lima, who is always a bundle of energy whenever he gets to the ballpark. And between innings, he got that good luck back. Trying to get the Astros going. And giving Smoltz the evil eye. And that's a call strike. Trying to get that Astros regular season mojo here in the postseason. Eusebio grounded out to second his first time. He was out there, what was it, 9 o'clock this morning swinging that same bat, trying to get everybody fired up. He was mad at the security people here at the ballpark, even before the fans got to the game, that they weren't excited. Put some music on. Chipper Jones. Number two. Sabio is gone. The Astros, after two runs in the first inning yesterday, have not scored now for 14 and two-thirds inning, or just the one run scored since the first inning yesterday. Look at the defensive positioning right here the Braves had going. They only had Chipper Jones on the left side of the infield. The shortstop Hernandez was almost directly behind second base. You can't do that with most third basemen, but Chipper Jones just has that kind of range. Well, that one just passed Chipper Jones. Tim Bogar, in his first postseason start, is now two for two. It keeps the inning going, so that at least Shane Reynolds, the pitcher, will not have to lead off the next inning. One to one the score in the last of the fifth inning now at Shea Stadium. Now lighter for the Mets. And Brian Anderson for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Arizona in the same position as the Houston Astros. 
having to win today or having to go home. There's ball one to Shane Reynolds. The Astros are talking to Vern Rule, their pitching coach from under Larry Durker before the game, about their bullpen plans for today. And he said, well, today it's just everybody in the staff. He said, Jose Lima included. That's a foul off to the right into the crowd. He said, if we can win this one and get to tomorrow, we'll figure out tomorrow then. Everything now is geared toward winning this one. We will hold nothing back. In terms of sending pitchers out there. Reynolds puts a fly ball into channel left center. Gerald Williams. And that is the inning. John Smoltz has shut them down on three hits through four innings. Atlanta leads it 2-0.